Good morning, this is Ben Socek with the Sierra Group and Home Downsizing Solutions. Uh, we provide multiple solutions to home sellers, uh, specifically uh, individuals that are considering the downsizing process. And we provide home buying services, as well as having our affiliated agents provide traditional home selling services, such as listing a house in a conventional manner. And, <clears throat> excuse me, today, I'd like to welcome Dan Flack with Casey Alderlaw uh, to our Zoom call. And they're, they have offices in Overland Park, Kansas, and Lee Summit, Missouri, as well as uh, Kearney, Missouri. Is that correct, Dan? That is correct, yes. Very good. And we run across uh, circumstances from time to time where a homeowner or their family is wanting to uh, get onto or get eligible for Medicaid, but they have assets such as a house, typically probably their last asset to take care of before that can happen. And so I wanted to get a, an expert uh, in that field and ask a few general questions. And I will mention that today is in July of 2020. And I'm sure as, as Dan will tell us, uh, these, uh, the, the rules for this are changing whenever. And so what we may talk, we, we might talk about today may not be applicable, uh, as Dan said, maybe tomorrow or three months, <laughs> six months from now or 12 months from now. So uh, please keep that in mind when you're watching this. And um, so anyway, Dan, welcome to our, our call today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate the time to, to talk about this subject and maybe some educate some people about it. Correct. I, I felt that uh, we wanted to provide education for individuals and so felt that this would be a great way to do it. Um, first, I guess, and this is a huge broad question, but when it pertains to a person wanting to become eligible for Medicaid and selling a house, uh, can you kind of discuss some of the general information about that particular circumstance? Absolutely. Um, and forgive me if I go into more than what you may be looking for. Uh, but um, when it comes to Medicaid, the house is an exempt asset. So even an individual who is not married and the house is vacant, they don't need to necessarily sell their house in order to be qualified for benefits. As long as they intend to return home, even though that intent may not be realistic, the house can be exempted. Now, that does not keep the state from putting a lien on the house, which they can and more, more often now will put a lien on the house to try to recover what they've paid out in benefits uh, while the person was on Medicaid. Um, so really what you're talking about when you're selling a house is taking an exempt asset and turning it into countable cash. So if it's a person who is already on benefits, they need to report the sale of the house to the state. The state then will ask them to show how much they got, prove that they received fair market value for the house, and then ask them where did the money go? Uh, what have they done with it? So what you end up having is if that money is going into a bank account, which it invariably is, that puts them over the Medicaid limit and they will have to then reduce those assets back down under the limit to get back on benefits. Uh, the, the other thing I would say is for people who are, are thinking, well, I'll just sell the house and I can give the money to my kids. You cannot give away money on Medicaid uh, for every, right now, it's about $6,000 to $7,000 is one month of ineligibility that they'll experience after they've given that money away. Um, uh, another thing is just since we're talking about giving things away. Um, a lot of people bring up the tax laws about being able to give away $15,000 a year or, so, or such. Uh, that does not matter to Medicaid. Medicaid assesses penalties on the first dollar you give away. And that would include transferring the house. If you decide you want to sell the house, but I don't want to get off Medicaid, I'll give the house to my son, daughter. That's a penalty as well. Is, uh, Dan, is that... Um what I would term, or I guess a layman would term, within that five-year look-back period, or if the 
gifting of assets is done more than five years uh, before that uh, trigger, so to speak, that activity that causes them to be on Medicaid, is that, a, I assume that's okay as long as it was done way in advance, uh, especially of that five-year look back period. Is that correct or? That's a, that's a great question and you're 100% correct. Um, what happens with, is when you go to apply for Medicaid, on the application, there is a question that asks, have you sold, transferred, or given away any assets within the last five years? Okay. So, if you are able to pre-plan before that five years, that's fantastic. Um, and another thing that's worth bringing up would be adding a joint owner to the property uh, would be a gift as well. Um, so if you have a house jointly titled with your son or daughter, uh, you gave away half of the value of the house at the time you added their name. I see, okay. I know that we've worked in circumstances where especially if a house is, uh, hasn't had anything done to it for, for literally decades, uh, 20, 30, 40 years, and it needs some serious repairs and updating to get it to what um, most people would claim its full potential value or full potential market value. And I know that we've had circumstances where a person says, well, look, you know, we need to sell this house for fair market value, and I certainly understand that. But typically we can show, both by pulling up comparables and uh, documenting the condition of the house uh, to show uh, the state or whoever is looking at this, that indeed they, they sold the house for, for basically the value of, of what the house was in its present condition. Uh, with your experience, have you run into circumstances where most of the time that that's a reasonable thing or is it a pretty in your experience is it is it very difficult to sell a house for what what we would term a fair value but others might say you know that that's not potential value right uh and with the state the first thing they look at when looking at the value is the county appraisal which we all know is not real um but then the next best thing, and really the best thing you can provide them to prove fair market value is an appraisal from a licensed appraiser. Um, so yeah, certainly if there's a house that's got mold or foundation work needed, a new roof, uh, even though they, you know, you can certainly, if you provide an appraised, uh, from a licensed appraiser an appraised value on the house, showing that it's worth what you got, that's accepted 100% of the time. Okay, very good. So we... Just to throw in then after that, the, the appraiser is, it's hard, they can't really argue with that. Um, the, the other thing that we sometimes will get is just a letter from a real estate agent who's in the area that said, you know, I've looked at the house based on the current market, the condition of the house, this is what I think it would sell for. Uh, they'll usually accept that as well, but uh, it's a little, it's a step below the appraiser. That's, uh, yes, I would tend to agree with that. And that's what we've tried to do in the past or, or have done, I should say, in the past is provided a, a local real estate agent to pull comparables so that they can see what we're looking at from a market value, potential market value uh, in that area. And then with documentation to show them that, you know, look, it has a kitchen that's 40 years old and bathrooms that are 30 to 40 years old and any structural damage that the, that the house might have to justify our pricing or, or the values there, therefore. Yeah, and I would even go so far as to say, um, if the house current value would be just to make up an example, $100,000, uh, and that's because the kitchen's old, or let, let's say the roof is, is needs repair. Um, well, maybe if you put 5,000 into the roof, you could get another 10,000 out of the house. Well, you could give that house away to a child, you would have the penalty because of the value before that roof was fixed. That child could then put the 5,000 into the roof, get the full 10,000 extra, that's $5,000 bonus. Um, but of course, then you're dealing, or even sell it to a child at the, at the fair market, the current appraised fair market value, they put a little into it, get more out of it. Mm -hmm. okay. But yeah, no, that's no problem. Okay. 
And uh, again, this is probably a, a broad question here, but is, uh, since you have offices on both the Kansas side and the Missouri side, uh, we, we work on both sides as well uh, in the Kansas City metro area. Uh, are there big differences from Kansas to Missouri or since it's a somewhat of, of a federal program, are, the, are they pretty similar to the way that people would look at this? Well, Medicaid is a joint federal state program. So what they do is there's a federal kind of a, a guideline, a framework that the states have to work within, but they do have a fair amount of leeway within that framework. So there are differences between the two states that can be significant. Um, just as an example, in Kansas, when you've got a married couple, if you're applying for one in the care center, the IRAs owned by the at-home spouse are exempt and do not count. Missouri, those IRAs count. Um, as far as real estate goes, the biggest difference is just more in how picky they are. Uh, for example, um, they will allow, they will exempt a house that is for sale or any, really any real estate that's for sale. Um, in Kansas, you stick a for sale sign in the yard, take a picture of it, you're done. Uh, in Missouri, they need to see that you've got a deal, you've, you've uh, marketed it, um, you show what you're asking for it. They, they just get into a lot more detail about what they wanna see on it. Uh, same thing with income producing property. Um, in Kansas, they're not as picky. In Missouri, it has to be earning a certain amount of return at 6% right now uh, on annually on the fair market value of the property. Hmm. So, and if you could. I can, go into, I can go into a lot more differences if you want to be too. No, no, that's fine. I, I was curious about the, if a person um, owns property that it has to be um, earning 6% on that asset with, is there a short answer to that, or is that going to be going down a, a, a rabbit hole we don't want well, to for, for a short call like this? <laughs> um, well, um, you know, it's just a matter of you've got to get something that shows what the fair value is of the property um, and then show, prove the amount of income you're receiving. Uh, I'm thinking in this example of like renting a house or a property like that, um, as long as you're getting that 6% based on the annual, uh, annually based on the current value and show them documentation of that. And so if a person has an asset that they're renting out and they can show that they're getting a 6% return on that asset, that ex that's an exempt so that they can still qualify right. for Medicaid, is that correct or? Right, in, in other words, uh, if you weren't earning 6%, if you've got your home and that's exempt, or even if you don't have a home, but you've got a house and uh, it was not your residence, so you can't exempt it that way, um, they want to count the value of it, the fair value of it, just like money in the bank. Uh, and you, there's no way you're going to qualify unless it's a very rundown place. Uh, but by exempting it, by, make, by showing you're earning the, the, the fair return on it, you exempt it so you don't have to get rid of the property itself. However, then the income from that property does count as income for the person on Medicaid. Uh, you can, though, keep enough of that income to pay the upkeep and the insurance and maintenance and costs for it. I see. Okay. And that might kind of be a transition into my next question here, which is um, typically when we make an offer to a home seller, we make more than one especially if they have a good amount of equity in a house. Uh, so some of the ways that we can benefit a seller is most companies that buy houses, at least to my knowledge, will only offer a, a one cash offer. It's just a one lump sum cash offer. And in our case, we can make them that offer, of course, but we can also make them uh, typically a much higher overall priced offer if it's easier for us to buy a house. So what that transition translates to is we can make monthly payments to a person to, to buy that house over time, it makes it easier for us to buy the house, translates into a higher price for that home seller. Uh, 
what we don't want to do, of course, is create a situation that does not, uh, that makes them ineligible for Medicaid down the line. Are there any guidelines that you might have for us or a seller in that situation? Yeah, um, th there are certain things. What you've done essentially is uh, created kind of, for lack of a better term, a promissory note, uh, where you're agreeing to pay an amount over a set period of time. Um, the biggest concerns there are the length of time over which you're going to pay have to be within the life expectancy of the individual based on their charts. Um, and it can't self-cancel at death. Uh, so, you, and this is something where really, um, it's, a, it's a phrase, it's a saying, it's thing that I say in all of these kinds of, of uh, interviews or what have you. Um, it's always best to talk to somebody who practices in this field to make sure what you're setting up is going to work. Uh, because as you pointed out at the beginning, these things change all the time. Mm -hmm. um, they may start saying, you know what, we're not going to do that anymore. We're not going to allow that. Um, now, right now, that's not a problem. And I'm not, I don't see any indications that something like that's going to change in the future. But uh, they do get very picky about things where you're getting on the edges of mm -hmm. the Medicaid program, if you will, um, not just their normal cut and dried things. Sure. Uh, but yeah, as long as right now, as long as you're within the life expectancy, equal payments over that time, and doesn't self cancel, uh, you're, you're on good, you're on good ground. Okay. All right. Again, like you're saying, there's all kinds of nuances there that, uh, that could change tomorrow, but, but that's, that's where we're at today, I guess. Right. So, right. Um, Anything else that you would like to add uh, to the conversation? I guess uh, questions that I didn't ask that might be pertinent that we didn't cover in regards to having real estate and, and uh, becoming eligible for Medicaid for people? Yeah, um, the biggest thing I think that, well, first and foremost, the biggest thing when it comes to, to real estate with the home is just always on the application, there is a question about intent to return. You're always going to check yes. Because as I've mentioned, it's, it's not realistic. Um, it does not have to be realistic. If there was a magic pill and this person had the health and mental capacity of they had when they were 20, absolutely they'd want to go home. Mm -hmm. So you're going to say, yeah, I'd go home. That keeps you from at least having to pay those bills or even not have the money to pay the bills, but not get the coverage while you're selling the property. Um, and then one other thing, which uh, I, I won't go off on a rant, although I could, but uh, as I mentioned, they exempt the home, but they don't let the person who's on Medicaid keep any of their income to pay for the home. Uh, so, and, and there I'm speaking of an individual. Um, when it's a married couple, the spouse at home is entitled to a certain level of income at a minimum. Um, and often, not, sometimes they'll be able to keep some of the income of the nursing facility spouse to get to that point. But it's not a very high level, changes annually, but uh, not a very high level. But when you're talking about a single individual in a care center, they, uh, they're not getting any money to pay for the taxes, the insurance, uh, the just keeping the utilities on to keep the pipes from freezing and bursting. Mm -hmm. So um, that's where it can be tricky. Um, and uh, yeah, I think those, those are the biggest things that trip people up, mainly that intent to return, always. And if, if there is such a thing as a short answer here, Dan, uh, one thing I think you touched on early and then I forgot to follow up with you is can, it, if there are two individuals married, individuals and one spouse um, could or should be maybe on, on Medicaid, but the other has and wants to remain in the home, is there a way for that to be possible? Uh, yes, yes. Um, and uh, again, I'll, I'll try to, to give you the short answer. 
Okay. Since that's not really, I guess, what this is about, but um, uh, what they do is it's, it's a division of assets. Um, and with that, they say, at the point where the person went into the hospital or care center, they total the assets at that time. There's certain minimums and maximums, but general example would be uh, if someone had $150,000, the couple as a whole, uh, in bank accounts, et cetera, CDs, savings, IRA, or retirement accounts, um, they divide that number in half. So if they had 150,000, they, they can get Medicaid when they're down to, to uh, 70, 75,000. Um, so they allow that at-home spouse to keep a portion of their funds so that they can continue to live their life and not be broke. Um, and they will also let them keep a minimum amount of income to maintain their lifestyle and, and go on paying bills. Um, there are ways to get that money from where you started to where you're eligible uh, that can be more beneficial than just paying the bills at the care center. Um, you can spend them down easily and quickly, paying off a mortgage or paying down on it, improving the house, as you mentioned, for sale later. Because um, there, you're taking cash that's countable, putting it into the house that's exempt. Um, but the biggest thing I would say uh, in all of this is check with someone who knows this, this Medicaid stuff. If you've got someone who is in need of care in a care center in the future or is already in, uh, it's never too soon. Um, our office offers free consultations. Um, you contact us, you can call us, visit our website, uh, kcelderlaw.com. We will be happy to go through your situation. Tell, we will sit down with, you'll sit down with an attorney for two hours. They'll go to it, go through it in detail, tell you what can be done, what we can do for you. And then you decide if you'd want to hire us. And of course, there's other, other attorneys in the area that also do this. But most importantly, check with someone who does Medicaid specific. Mm -hmm. One thing that people go to an estate planning attorney and get Medicaid advice from them. Well, they don't know what latest changes have happened. They don't do this as their normal practice. So uh, look for that Medicaid part. Okay. Very good. Well, thank you, Dan, for taking the time uh, this morning to uh, talk, talk to me and provide the information and uh, hopefully some good information and education for individuals that watch this. And certainly if people have questions, please contact uh, yourself or one of your uh, partners there at Casey Elder Law. And, um, and have a great day. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you for having me. You too.